All right, let's begin tonight. Um, tonight, we move away from the hay packs. We're, I, I think I'm finished with that. Um, I'm definitely finished with it for about a month because I want to take the next four weeks and do a little mini series. In these meetings, we've done series on the church. We've done series on Christ, uh, or I'm sorry, on the cross. What we haven't done is one specifically focused on the offices of Christ. And I want to do that for the next month. And I, I want to do it in a way that complements the story of Israel because that's the biblical story. And Jesus comes at, I think, and this will be the premise of a lot of what I say over the next several weeks, I think Jesus comes at the climactic point of Israel's story. Not early in Israel's story, but as the climax, as the fulfillment of the, prophet, of the promises made to Israel. I think Paul agrees, the Apostle Paul, because Paul pitches Jesus as the seed and claims that all of the promises were to a seed, not to seeds. And so Paul tries to be singular, in his approach instead of plural, which is very amazing because Paul is a Jew and he's coming from a Jewish background and he knows he's the part of the seeds of Abraham and yet he still makes that singular. So in that we see Paul, I think Paul making the climactic event, Jesus. Okay, well, we are Jesus centric. I try to be in all of our lessons, but we haven't done a focus on his offices because um, I don't know why, it's not, there's never a reason why we don't do something, we just have something else that we're doing. But um, this has been on my mind for a while and I've sketched it out a little bit over the last several weeks, sort of waiting until it was the right time to move forward on it. And um, to do it right, I, let me give you this little preview. Um, tonight is not a sermon, it's not a message, it's not even really a lesson in the way that our others have been, in which they have really heavy leanings in the gospel. By gospel, I mean literally the good news. What I try to do is give you good news so that you leave with better news than you've heard on the news or anywhere else in the world. Hopefully, good news is better than all that other stuff. Otherwise, how good is it? I do that, try to do that every week. Um, I'm a preacher at heart, and so most of the time our lessons turn into preaching. And even if I'm trying to teach, they end up with an element of preach, and I do feel there's a distinct difference, and I intentionally blur the lines. Tonight's not one of those. Um, tonight is probably better suited for a classroom. And I, don't, I hope that doesn't sound boring, um, but it's probably better suited for a, a class on understanding um, the offices of Christ. And I mean that in a way in which we're gonna try to look at the history. We're gonna try to look at the way the scriptures are set up. We're gonna try to look at Israel's story, but we're not gonna do it through a gospel lens. We're gonna do it through a biblical studies lens. And I think I've earned your trust. I know, I, I know we've got people who've watched and listened for a long, long time who keep coming back because they get a little bit different sound with our ministry. And so I'm gonna lean into that a little bit tonight, realizing that, that we've built up that rapport. Um, I wanna title this Prophet, Priest, and King. This is a very familiar phrase. I, of course, I'm not, this is, I'm not coining this. People have been preaching Prophet, Priest, and King in regards to who Jesus is and what Jesus does for as long as we've been preaching Jesus. And we, I want to do it this way in that tonight I want to talk to you about why we do prophet, priest, and king. Why don't we do uh, athletes, farmers, and soldiers? We did that during the hay packs. Paul used athletes, farmers, and soldiers in one of his passages. Why don't we have Christ the athlete, Christ the farmer, Christ the soldier? Well, we know we have more than prophet, priest, and king. Okay, so I'm not naive. There's, he's the door. He's a shepherd. He's all the things he says he is. But these are offices that dominate Israel's story. In fact, I want to show you that these are the three offices that dominate Israel's story, left to right, chronologically. And that's what we're going to do in, tonight in our walkthrough. So I want to focus on those three dominant offices that already were telling Israel's story. Then Jesus comes along as the fulfillment of Israel's story. Thus, Jesus becomes the ultimate expression of the prophetic, the priestly, and the monarchical. And in Christ, then, all of those things begin to make sense. Without Christ, they're just human institutions, perhaps, uh, somewhat secular, sometimes overtly secular, not necessarily spiritual. You don't think spiritual when you think king. And so those positions are not inherently theological, even. And yet here comes Jesus and perfectly fits the role in the ideal. And so I want to lay out prophet, priest, king, and then next week we'll do... Jesus as prophet, and then we'll do Jesus as priest, Jesus as king. So there's going to be less focus tonight on trying to explain the priesthood. 
So I'm going to be less focused tonight on trying to explain the office of prophet and the office of king. We're going to save those. That's, what, that's why we have a miniseries. But there is going to be a focus on why they matter at all. Why do we choose these three and not the others? And I think it's because Israel's story is there. So let's ground it, as I love to do, in some scripture. Why? Okay, from a scriptural standpoint, why do we say that Jesus is a prophet, priest, and king? Why don't we say Jesus is a, you know, a shepherd, a fisherman, and an and a oldest son, or whatever? Um, all the things we could say. Well, maybe it's this. Well, here's our text tonight. Revelation chapter 1. I add four, but where we're going is five. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come. There's Jesus across time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a repeat of the Hebrew story. From the seven spirits who was before his throne and from Jesus Christ. Watch verse 5. The faithful witness, the, first form, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now tonight, I'm going to use the screens in a way in which they serve more as an outline than they do as like two sentences of principles or five sentences of information. And we're going to use them. This first slide will just be this whole verse, but we're going to kind of move point to point tonight and just let it, um, let, let's sort of populate these three offices, okay? And then when we get into the teaching over the next few weeks, we can just sort of insert Jesus in there. But watch verse 5, the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, which actually is present in the ancient Greek, not past. The oldest Greek translation, to he who loves us, not to he who loved us. To him who loves us and washes us from our sins in his own blood. By the way, had we translated that properly in the Greek, we would get rid of the argument of the Bible never says Jesus loves you. I've heard that argument. You guys say Jesus loves you. The Bible never actually has it saying Jesus loves you. It has a God so loved the world. Um, but it does. Um, let's break these down. This is where we get prophet, priest, and king. So Jesus Christ is the subject of Revelation 1.5. And he's, he's told to be three things. He's told to be a faithful witness. He's told to be firstborn from the dead. He's told to be ruler over the kings of the earth. And I present that this is the revelator's way of couching Jesus in Israel's offices. The three offices that categorize the history of Israel as a people. The office of priest the office of prophet, and the office of king. Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet in that he is a faithful witness because the prophet speaks from God to the people effectively because he's speaking for God, he's showing God. So the prophet is showing people who God is, therefore he's a faithful witness, much like the, the book of Hebrews would say about the Holy Spirit, who witnesses to us that which he saw God do. The role of the Holy Spirit works in the prophetic. And we're going to, to, as we dig into that in the coming weeks, prophet, priest, king, I want to really dig into why that was important to Israel because not only did the prophet show God to them, the prophet was to combat ignorance. And so the, the prophet was to be the source, the fountainhead of information about God so that people wouldn't be ignorant of what God thought or wouldn't be ignorant of what God expected of them. Um, living in an old covenant world in which they didn't have access, well, they didn't have access to the written scripture, but also in which it wasn't taught that each individual could go to God. That's, that's a new covenant teaching, not an old covenant teaching, that all of you have access to God. We're so used to that as Christians, we can't fathom that the beginning of Judaism did not have that as its root, that you get to go to God if you want to. But instead, if you want to know who God is, you listen to the voice of the prophet. He helped you to combat ignorance. Jesus then is the faithful witness serving in the office of prophet. He also calls him the firstborn from the dead, and that has Jesus as a priest. Well, why? Because Christ as firstborn from the dead, this is a Pauline principle. As firstborn, he's first fruits. He's not last. He's first. He's not the only. He's just the beginning. In other words, there will be many, many more born. He's the first and thus the representative man. When Paul says that as in Adam all die, so in the last Adam, so in Christ shall all be made alive, he calls Jesus not second Adam, but last Adam. 
Therefore, Adam, I'm sorry, Christ becomes Adam in front of God. And that's the role of a priest. Because a priest is showing people to God. Prophets showing God to people. Priests showing people to God. Firstborn from the dead is that which rises up from the soil of a new creation. Jesus becomes the representative face forward of priesthood. Therefore, firstborn from the dead is a priest and the priest leads us to God. But he also combats guilt. The whole role of the priesthood was to work on that guiltiness, either to cause you to know you're guilty because you saw your priest or to help alleviate your guilt because you went to your priest. Something that many, many segments of the church still have. You feeling bad? Go to your priest. Go see the priest. Why? Because the office is meant to combat your guilt. The office is meant to give you a conduit by which to present yourself to God. And then finally, in Revelation 1.5, he's the ruler over the kings of the earth. This one's probably the easiest one to ferret out of all of them because the word is right there in it. He's a ruler over the kings of the earth. This is Christ as king. And the king joins together. He's a king over a kingdom. Thus, he unifies his kingdom. So in a king, we join together and he glorifies us with God, but he's also the conqueror. So just as the priest combats ignorance and the prophet combats, or the prophet combats ignorance and the priest combats guilt, the king conquers sin and conquers tyranny because kings conquer. It's what they do. So we have to have Christ the conqueror, then we have to have Christ the king. So this becomes the template. Revelation 1.5. He sees Jesus. Remember, Revelation is apocalypse. It's the unveiling. It's pull the curtain up. Let you see Jesus in a way you haven't seen him before. And so how does he describe him? Essentially, prophet, priest, king. What that would mean to Israel is a retelling of their story. That's not all. There's also another line there at the bottom of Revelation 1.5, and that he loves us, and I used the present, not the past tense. He loves us, and he frees us. So the role of Christ becomes prophet, priest, king, to show us the love of God, and to free us from our guilt and our sin. Therefore, love and forgiveness become the hallmarks of the prophetic, priestly, monarchical office of Jesus. So Revelation 1.5 has Christ as a priest, Christ as a prophet, Christ as a king, but a prophet, priest, and king who both loves his subjects, his people, and who works actively to free them. That cannot be said of every prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament. And you don't have to know much about prophets, priests, and kings to know that their role was not necessarily one of love and was certainly not always one of freeing people. So we already have a uniqueness in Christ in Revelation 1.5 if we didn't do any other work, if we didn't have this many series on Christ as the prophet, priest, and king. You already have this baseline of, well, Jesus sounds different than the others. That's because Jesus is the fulfillment of the story. Let's walk through their story. And I use a little bit of timeline work tonight too, not because I want you to memorize dates. History that confines itself only to dates is dry because it doesn't put life into the past. It doesn't use the past to inform the present. It just uses the past to memorize dates. So if you're teaching people history, you go, everybody got to memorize this date. It's probably not going to interest anybody. It's why most people hate history because it was just dates, dates and places, people's names. Um, so I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to show this. I want to tell the story, but I want to tell it in a way that, that, that allows us to relate it, not only to, through Christ, but also to relate it to us. So let's tell Israel's story this way. I think through the course of the Old Testament, we can break Israel's journey into three major components. If you started in Genesis and you read through Malachi, you would walk with Israel through three basic periods of their history. Okay. Those three basic periods of their history have sort of as its figurehead these three offices. The prophet, priest, and king. It just sounds aesthetically better to say prophet, priest, and king, but it's not chronologically correct. <laughs> it's actually priest, king, prophet. When you say it, it just doesn't sound as good. Jesus is priest, king, prophet. But it's also not Revelation 1.5. Revelation 1.5 is he's prophet, he's priest, and he's king, and that's where we came up with that, even though it just sounds better too. But for purposes of Israel's story, we start at the beginning. That's the best place to start. The Exodus phase of Israel, we'll also call this the liturgical phase of Israel because this is where Israel begins to have a worship style. They don't have a religion 
Um, they only barely would call themselves a people, but they have a worship style and it's an Exodus liturgical style. Out of this will come priests. So we're going to work on what, why, they're, why they have a priesthood. And this period falls somewhere around 1250 BC um, and lasts a couple hundred years. The space between um, the, the exodus of God's people and sort of a reorganization, an organization, a hierarchical organization of God's people is not, actually not very long. Here's some of the things that categorize this that are pretty important. This is the first time that they become God's people, but they're largely a verbal people in that they only know they're God's people because dad told me and grandpa told me and great grandpa told me. And they trace their story through story. I, don't, I didn't mean to be redundant there. It's really the only way to say it. They trace their story through story by verbally telling the story. This is why they're such a verbal society by the time Jesus gets there. Their very roots were verbal. Their roots were not printed. Their roots were verbal. So they told their story over and over and they began to identify themselves as God's people through one major act, not creation, not Adam and Eve, not Noah's flood. They, not even circumcision. I know we, that's almost anachronistic that we as Christians look back and go, they knew they were God's people because they were circumcised. Not in the beginning. That's not what it was. What caused them to know they were God's people is God delivered them. They mattered. They were a bunch of slaves in a foreign land who are set free from slavery and only God could do that. And so their story revolved around an exodus, a departure. That's what that word literally means. An exodus, a departure. Well, literally a decease, a leaving of one land and a going into another. So it's in this, they're identified as God's people. But they have a story, and the story is a story of deliverance that gets shaped by their liturgy. They start doing things to tell their story. The doing of them become religious activities, but no one would have called it a religion. For instance, every year we raise a lamb for four days in our house. And at the end of the four days, we make sure he's spotless and he doesn't have any blemishes. And at the end of four days, we kill him. And everybody in the family eats it and we take his blood and we mark it on the doorposts of our house. Hey kids, do you know why we do this? And that's how they tell their story of deliverance and the stories become their liturgy. This is why we eat this lamb. This is why we shed this blood. This is why we build booths at the Feast of Tabernacles. And the, the, the religion, for lack of a better word, springs forth out of their stories. Everything they do has meaning. Nothing they do has no meaning. But everything they do has the meaning of telling their story as they come along. And in the middle of that, they develop Torah. A set of codes legal codes, legal laws, don't think of it like this yet, okay? Don't think of it as a book. Think of it as a system. Think of it as, and I'm not saying they're not written down, but don't think of it as something that you went to the local market and bought a Torah, stuck it under your arm and went home. That's not it at all. But they start to write down their codes. They start to write down their liturgy. Here's how we kill the animal. Here's why we kill the animal. Here's what's allowed to be in the sacrifice. Here's what's not allowed to be in the sacrifice. Oh, by the way, because we are God's people, delivered, we don't look like anybody else. Therefore, we don't dress like them. We don't cut our hair like them. We don't mark our bodies like them. We don't have sex the way they do. We don't talk the way. These are literally in the code. There's all of these things that go, we're God's people. We need to look like it, dress like it, act like it, smell like it, eat like it, you know, and everything else. And so those codes begin to develop as is, but they're an exodus people. They're a, they're a transient people. They're a people on the move, telling the stories of their deliverance, building a liturgy, all of which is to tell the same story. Even in their no mixture stuff, it's we're not like everybody else. We don't mix with them. Therefore, you don't wear two different fabrics on your body at the same time. We go, we look at that from a lens way out and go, what in the world's that all about? And we re if we're understanding why they're doing it, we realize it was built around the liturgy of who they are. They also had no 
organized society for all intents and purposes and no hierarchy. They don't have elections. They don't vote for a president. They don't have a real leader. They are as close to a theocracy as the world has maybe ever seen. Um, they're, they're, the, the transientness is expressed as well, not just in Torah, but what I call Torah intent. Um, and that they, the tent of the tabernacle is an expression of a people that have never found their home. They're always on the move. This is Israel. This is the early chunk of their story. A people on the move who pick up their tent and they move, pull up your tent stakes and move. They're pulling up their tent stakes and moving. They've even developed a God who doesn't look anything like the other gods. So much so, he doesn't look like anything at all. They're the first people. Think about this. They're the first people that we know of in the history of the world who had a God that they did not, they were not allowed to draw. They were not allowed to make statues of or pictures of. They, he was literally invisible. The only expression they had of him is they lived in between two cherubims on the top of a box called the Ark of the Covenant. And they moved him from spot to spot. But they, but they, even in their monotheism, that alone made them different because there was no monotheistic societies. There was polytheistic societies, societies with multiple gods. So Israel having a monotheistic society alone is unusual, but they're so unusual in that they refuse to show their God. This is their greatest achievement as far as I can see. The greatest achievement of the liturgical era is to voice and revoice the story of the deliverance. And what is birthed in the liturgical, what is birthed in the Exodus is the priesthood. This is where the priesthood is born in Israel as a liaison from a transient people to the God no one can see, that they don't have statues of. And so the priesthood becomes an office that recasts the story over and over by doing the liturgy. So the priesthood goes into this tent and they slaughter animals and they offer up incense and they wave the smoke in front of the curtain and they trim, trim the wicks on the candles and they lay out unleavened bread and all of the actions have something behind them. This represents this, this represents this, this represents this, but it's the priesthood that sort of brings it all together, that says that's what that stands for, that's what that stands for, and so that's really all they need. Just this office of priests to represent things bigger than themselves and to do it in the collective. Um, in each of these states, there's a bit of a descent. We, we kind of slip. We don't run rushing headlong from one wave into the next wave in Israel and into the next wave. There's a little bit of a malaise in between in each of these where um, you, 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 I don't want to say there's a falling off, but it's almost like we're dissatisfied. There's periods of dissatisfaction in the Old Testament. Because you would think that the, the story of God's people would be like this. All the way to the Messiah. I mean, if you were writing this yourself, here's God's people, this is great, 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 great. But you know that's not it. And there's, it's, it's a lot more like this. And sometimes it's like this. And sometimes it's almost like they disappear altogether. And in a way, that's what gets us to the need for a Messiah. Because the priests and the kings and the prophets haven't brought us everything we hoped they would bring us. So out of priesthood, we enter the second stage of Israel's story. This takes a chunk of your Bible, the monarchical, the royal state, or what you could refer to as the state church, because then you marry the religion with the nation of Israel. They are not a nation simply like the other nations. They are a nation defined by this religion that was birthed out of that Exodus period. This lasts a pretty good chunk of time. We, we start to see the kings. Saul, that comes onto the scene right around 1000 BC, about 10 centuries before Christ. 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon comes in and sacks Jerusalem. By 587 BC, the Babylonians have completely kicked Israel and Judah out of the land. By 586 BC, it's complete dispersion. And so you do have this window of just over 400 years where Israel stops being transient. They set down roots. That transient people become conquering people. They set down roots and they begin to make 
demands. I want to read an entire Old Testament chapter for you because we didn't do a lot of text tonight. So we're going to do one big, it's 22 verses. But I promise it's not like 22 verses of exegetical teaching. I just want to show you the chapter where it happens. Okay, here's the great transition chapter of the Old Testament. It takes you from priesthood. Priesthood sort of slides into judges. You start getting guys and gals, really men and women, who judge Israel as a, sort of a liaison between them and God, just a, almost a glorified priesthood. And Israel becomes dissatisfied because they begin to look at the nations of the world. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. It came to pass when Samuel was old, Samuel's the judge, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes. They perverted justice. That was not unusual, by the way. Priests have been doing that for the entire Exodus story. You got bad priests, good priests, bad priests, good priests. So we're wearing out on it, though. It's like there's got to be a better way, right? We got to be a better way than this. So all the elders get together because they're going to come up with a better way. They get together and come to Samuel at Ramah. And they say to him, look, you're old. Like he didn't know that. And your sons do not walk in your ways. He probably knew that. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. There's the crucial phrase of 1 Samuel 8. Like all the nations. And the people of God are always at a loss when they look to be like all the nations. But it's our story and we're sticking to it. <laughs> and I'm going to show you before we're done that we really do stick to it. <laughs> the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Of course, he goes to Jehovah, all caps. He goes to the covenant God. And he goes, what would a covenant God say about this if I were to ask him, what do you want me to do, God? Seven. The Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all they say to you. Because they have not rejected you, they've rejected me. And in case you missed it, we're definitely on a downslide. This is one of those, we're going hard and fast because this is God talking. Go, they didn't reject you. They've rejected me. They don't want me to do this for them any longer. They don't want me to reign over them. There's your hint that we're entering something else because priests haven't reigned over anybody. God has through the priesthood, but they're wanting a reign, an R-E-I-G-N. According to all the works which they've done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt. There's the transient people. There's the Exodus people. That's their whole story right there in verse 8. I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day. They've forsaken me. They've served other gods. So they're doing to you also. Nine. And, <clears throat> nine. Yeah. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them. Show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. Now, I want you to notice God doesn't say who this man will be. No one yet knows who this man will be. God is defining what kings do. He's not defining an individual. So there's no getting around this. You can pick your best king, and God has already told you what he'll do. Okay? It doesn't matter if he's a David or a Saul. The truth is that I'm going to show you what a king will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. Verse 11. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He'll take your sons and he'll appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen and some will run before his chariots. He'll appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He'll set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. Israel's never had this. This is conscription. This is a standing army forced at the hand of a monarch. God said, this is what you're going to get if you step into the realm of kings. 13. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and he'll give them to his servants. Eminent domain. If the nation needs it, the nation gets it. God, this is what you're asking for. This is what you'll have. Eminent domain will take the best of your fields. It'll never take the worst, by the way. It'll always take your best. 15. He'll take a tenth of your grain. National taxes. Local taxes. He'll take a tenth of your grain and your vintage. He'll give it to his officers and servants. This isn't a tithe. 
The tithe was to the priesthood. The tithe was to the tribe of Levi. He goes, you're going to add taxes to yourself. You're going to make it harder on yourself than it already is. He's going to take a tenth and he'll take your male servants and your female servants and your finest young man and your donkeys and he'll put them to his work. 17. He'll take a tenth of your sheep. There's another tax because one tax will never be enough. And you'll be his servants and you'll cry out in that day because of the king whom you've chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. You see, that sounds pretty cold, right? Remember, Jesus is going to be the end of the story, right? We have to exhaust you on natural priests. We have to exhaust you on natural kings and we have to exhaust you on natural, prof nat uh, natural prophets. That's, that's why we got to end up in revelation with Jesus. The Lord's not going to hear you in that day, 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. You would have thought Samuel's speech would have got them, shook them out. And they went, oh, we don't want any of that. But no, we're too infatuated at this point with looking like the nations around us. No, we want a king because we want to be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us ugh, and fight our battles. And there's where we marry ourselves. This is bowing your knee to the devil. When you look out across in the wilderness and you look out across all the nations of the earth and the devil goes, if you just bow knee to me, I'll take care of this for you. And there's always going to be somebody who'll, who'll say, you set back, we'll do the fighting. Go before us and fight our battles. 21, 22, close. This is the end of the chapter. Samuel heard all the words of the people. He repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice, make him a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. And the darkness, you can feel it, like the sun just went down in Israel. And we don't realize what's about to transpire, but we've just entered into the monarchical, or we'll call it the state church phase. All right? So let, let, me, let me tick off, just tick some of these off for you as we walk through this. This is the phase of kings. The descent of the priesthood would lead to judges. The judges would lead to the longing for a king. It's really just the desire to be like what's around us. Liturgy is still important at this time. I mean, there's still a religious people. In fact, liturgy has become extremely important. The problem is, is that liturgy takes a backseat to the matters of state. You've got six books of your Bible. You just read a piece of the first one. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. They all busy themselves with the state religion. They're just monarchical stories. They're Israel looking like a glorified Philistines. Israel looking like glorified Moabites or glorified Amorites. And they just keep fighting people and staying at war. And the spiral continues and we get these national stories and we get these localized stories and we get stories of failure. There's not an enormous amount of success in these stories. And the only successes we find are coming at the ends of swords and people dying. Like the only thing we can get real excited about is Goliath gets killed in the middle of, a, uh, of the story. It's his head chopped off. The, because the stories look increasingly more and more like the nations of the world around them. And what happens in the state church is kings, I mean, the next one, kings build temples. And so we go from being a tent people to a temple people, a people grounded with a foundation. The temple begins to be sort of the center point of the liturgy in the monarchical period because when you marry church with state, well, you marry everything about state. You don't just get to pick and choose. Like we want the good stuff, we don't want the bad stuff. You get all the stuff. And I've been saying this before, and I'll, I'll keep blasting this horn. When you marry church and state, the state doesn't care. The church hurts. Like the state doesn't get in trouble at all. But the church gets messed up. And so the minute we go, kings are building the temples and building the palaces, they start to mirror the things of the world. And it won't take long till you'll end up with a Jesus at the end of Matthew 23 saying, your house is left to you desolate. This doesn't look anything like what my dad constructed because the more that man sort of puts his hands into it, the more it begins to look like the things of this world. And then finally, this is the period where sages and prophets are born. This is why we get the wisdom literature in the middle of the Bible. It doesn't fall in the middle of the Bible coincidentally. The Proverbs and the Ecclesiastes and people come along saying things. We don't have a lot of that in the early part of the Bible. 
But we've got a lot of writings. Like if, if you've ever read the Proverbs, you don't want to live by the Proverbs. You want to live by Christ. Because there's going to be good Proverbs, and there's going to be some of them that you go, what in the world's going on here? But the sages are birthed, and they borrow the things of the world in the way that they talk and in the way that they write, and out of it comes the prophetic as well. And then they come into their fullness in our third stage. And this is the third part of your story. I guess you could say it this way. The first part of it is kind of here, and then it's kind of here, and then it's that sliver heading into the between the testaments. Pre-exile and exile, it's the time of the prophets. And that's why you get the major prophets and the minor prophets at the back. But prophets don't really come along until they got something to talk about. Okay? The prophet has to have something to... Let's be honest. The prophet of the Old Testament has to have something to harp on. Without something to harp on, he doesn't really have a job. And so it has to be a people who have so entrenched themselves with the state, so entrenched themselves with the power structures of the powers that be, with the system of the world, that the prophet, prophetic has to come along to be a counter voice, like a counter revolution against what's been going on for a long, long time. And so out of this are born the prophets. And here's some of the interesting things that happen in Israel's history at this point. The Hebrew Bible starts to take shape. It's kind of easy for us as Christians to think that one day Moses is kicked back outside of his tent and he pulls out a big old scroll and licks the end of a feather and dips it in you know, some ink and he just goes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And, you know, and he's just sort of conduit this stuff down while Joshua was out here fighting Moses, writing his, his uh, you know, masterpiece. And then one day he comes out and he goes, here it is. It's called Genesis. And then everybody reads it and goes, oh, this is how we started, is that Moses told us that God told him how we started. I know I'm being silly. That is actually how some people think this came about, was that God took Moses off into a corner and gave him the book of Genesis. We call it the book of Moses because he's the main character. Because the story of the Torah rotates around, I mean, the exodus happens in book two. Like if it's a five book series, the main characters on the scene from the beginning of book two, spoiler alert, till just before the end of book five when he dies and writes his own death, which is fascinating. Okay, my point is, that's not how the Torah came to be at all. It had already become, begun to be written down. It had already begun to be scraps of paper and parchment. But in the exilic period, they have to tell their story. They've been telling it like this for years through story. They've been doing it for years through liturgy. Now they're, they don't have a temple, they don't have a home, they don't have a house. They don't have a place. And so they begin to assemble the writings and begin to assemble what we would call the Hebrew Scriptures. And they begin to write down the things that they've heard told to them over and over and over again. And that's why it'll say it one way in Exodus and then it'll say it another way in Deuteronomy. And if you're being really honest with yourself when you read Torah, it's exactly what happens. And it'll say it here, but then it'll say it differently here. Why? Because we're working as they begin to write over the course of time. They begin to expand these into the scriptures. And then we get to text over temple. Israel literally becomes a people of the book. By the time of Christ, they're a people of the book. They have the temple, but it's not the heartbeat of Judaism in Jesus' day. They, they have the book. And the book is beginning, and I don't mean it looks like this, but they have the sacred text. They have the scriptures. Talk about this last week when we talk about God breathed. And Peter's saying to Timothy, you've been reading the scriptures since your youth. You've heard them. These are the things that bring you to salvation in Christ. So there are people of the book, and out of this comes stuff like apocalyptic literature. This is the first time in the history of the world that we really see this codified in the theology of, of, of God's people is the books like Daniel and Zechariah, which are apocalyptic in scope, begin to come onto the scene because people are needing hope for the future in the midst of an exilic world. Just in case you don't know, exile means they lost their land. They lost their temple and they lost their land and they get dispersed back into Babylon. The people of God who had left slavery go back into a dispersed state, meaning that they're just put out into someone else's nation. 
and they either live or die, but they don't have a country that is their own. In the middle of this period is the birth of the synagogue. By the time Christ comes along, this is a major part of Judaism. The synagogue becomes a place where exiled people can get together in the same room and talk about their scriptures and retell their stories. They don't have a temple to go to, but they have a text to talk over. I used to wonder how has Judaism made it since the fall of the temple? Because I naively thought that Judaism rotated around temple. It had never rotated around temple. Temple was a part of their faith, but the text had become that which codified their stories. And out of that came synagogue, a place where you came together and read the text out loud. It was the, what we have tried to copy and probably do a terrible job in the modern church. Copy a space where people come together and listen to the text and learn and talk about it together and argue over it. Um, it's very foreign. And you can read any rabbi, particularly of the ancient world, will tell you this. Um, Christians and Jews have two entirely different ways of approaching scriptures in that Christians demand that the scripture be univocal, all of them saying one voice. Jews are completely satisfied with it being multivocal, like seven different voices saying relatively the same thing. Four of them are pretty close. One of them's kind of out there in left field. The other two might be heretics, but we'll talk about all of them. Literally, Christians are like, nope, there's only one way or the highway, bless God. And that makes us unique, <laughs> maybe not in the best way. Um, but they, all the way back to the ancient rabbis would tell you that, there was their, that the scriptures were supposed to be discussed, argued over, thought about, fought about, and then we go to our places. And that was church. And I kind of long for it in a way in our Christian circles to at least be able to talk text and talk scripture and go, it's not, it's not about getting answers. It's, it's not about getting answer. It's about getting answers. And then we go work on them. But that was birthed in synagogue. That mentality was birthed in synagogue. This is what allows Jesus to come along in Luke 4, get up and read the scripture and then comment. When he comments on it, that was normal. Like he's giving his commentary on that scripture. And then one more. They're an exilic people, which means they're in exiles, but they take their identity in being exiles. They're not just exodus people anymore. It's not just a place they've come from. They take their identity in a people who have no home. They take their identity in people who are strangers in a strange land. Now, um, that gets us pretty close to being ready to see Jesus as fulfilling these offices. Uh, before we do that, I'll, I'll throw this one more thought at you to kind of kick around this week. I think these stages are repeated in the church. Um, the church had its original exodus from Judaism. Their entire story was story. Let me tell you what I saw. I was with Jesus. I walked with him by Galilee. They didn't have a text. For the first nearly 40 years of Christian history, they had nothing written down about their story. In microcosm, they were the front part of the Old Testament. They were a group of people on the move coming out of one thing and into another. Paul said, don't be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. He's using Exodus talk. You came out of slavery, don't go back into slavery. We're an Exodus people. When the stories do start to be written down, they write them down that way. They have Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. Speaking of his Exodus. They literally use the Greek word. Speaking of his Exodus, which was coming in Jerusalem. They see themselves as a people who've come out of one place and into another. Their liturgy is their story. They don't have a liturgy. They don't know what to do relative to their faith other than talk. And so they preach and they discuss and they argue and they debate and they testify. But it's the same thing in that they've come from one thing. By the way, Peter and Paul would not have told you they had left Judaism. Um, they might have been like Malcolm X, you know. Um, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us, you know. Peter and Paul might have been, we didn't leave Judaism. Judaism left us. You know, we, we're in the way. They even coined a phrase for it. We're in the way. I don't know where they are, but they're not in the way. And so they didn't think they had a religion. They just felt like they had found their Messiah. And so they hold on to the only forms that they have. But in their earliest stage, there's an exodus. And then by 350 AD, the church marries itself pretty lockstep with the state. 
Constantinian, Constantinian Christianity makes Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. The fight about what church is the church gets settled not in the halls of theology, but in the halls of state. It's the state that goes, that's the church, and everybody else is a heretic. And you give up something of yourself when you marry yourself to that. And they did. And those factions of the church kept kind of doing this, you know, up until about the Dark Ages. The Orthodox finally turned really hard one way and the Catholic Church turned really hard the other way. They kind of got along for about 650 years kind of doing this. And then they went like this and then here comes the Reformation and then just fracture, 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 fracture. But a lot of it out of that monarchical state, a lot of it out of that church and state. And then finally, which I think is good news, exiles in a strange world. Because... There's always been a faction in the church that did not align itself. There's always been a Daniel and a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that refused to eat the king's meat. They've always existed as exiles. They've always refused to bow to the king. They've always been different. They've always said, that's not my first allegiance. My first allegiance is to Christ. So in a way, we mirror their journey. If we mirror their journey, let's complete it. Revelation 1, 4, 5. Seven churches in Asia, grace to you, peace. Him who is, who was, who is to come. Jesus Christ, faithful witness, prophet, firstborn from the dead, priest, ruler over the kings of the earth, king, the one who loves us and washes us, forgives us from our own sins in his blood. The ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest, the ultimate king. Final thought. Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel's story, the fulfillment, the climax of her journey. He becomes the role that's needed in every area, every season, every calendar. When we see Christ as priest, king, and prophet, I didn't use prophet, priest, and king. I used him in Israel's order. They had a priest, then they had kings, then they had prophets. When we see him as priest, king, and prophet, we're seeing the full expression of God in every hour that the church goes through. Our only hope in each hour is not to go back to the formulas of Israel, priests, kings, and prophets, but to go to the fulfillment of every one of those eras, Jesus Christ. So the New Testament ends by recapping Israel's story in one man, priest, prophet, king. We're going to work on those next week. We'll start, we'll do the phonetically familiar, prophet, priest, king. That'll be the order. So we'll start with prophet, Jesus as prophet. Um, why that is important, what that means, I'm really looking forward to it because they're pictures of Jesus that we get to dig into the scriptures and see where he looks like superior to all of these other things. Let's say a prayer that is just a prayer to settle our hearts as you study and wrestle this out and prepare us as we move forward. And each one who will watch this and listen to this down the road might work their way right through this series and prepare your heart for what he's going to do. Father, I thank you for this little time in the word and I pray that as we have taken a look at your journey over, or our journey through you, that we have been true, as true as possible to your, to the spirit of you and your love. As we've tried to discover our own self in this story, our own failures, we're not trying to point fingers at Israel, but showing that we are that same story, that we have the propensity to go through those same journeys, and that at the end of the day, the separator is Christ. Give us a revelation of that Jesus over the next several weeks as we explore Christ the prophet, Christ the priest, and Christ the king. May we have revelations of it as we never have before. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.